let's consider some of the grade nine ideas that will fit almost any essay on a Christmas carol. The traditional interpretation is that Scrooge changes once he has been confronted by the ghost of Christmas yet to come. However, did you notice that he first started to change his mind in stave two when he goes back in time to Fezziwig's Christmas party and then asks the ghost about Bob Cratchit? He's thinking about changing his role as an employer. Now, this is a really important clue that Dickens wants to reach his readers who are employers much more than he wants them to give to charity. Charity seems to come around at Christmas, but an employer is going to benefit everybody all the time. This is why he's so specific about the amount that Fred is going to be paid if he gets his job and how specific he is about how much Bob is paid. Because Dickens wants to point out that Scrooge is a miser, but he's not a miserly employer. And by that I mean he is paying the going rate. When I wrote my guide, I even researched how far the average Victorian bank worker would walk to work. Three miles, exactly the same as Bob has to walk from Scrooge's back to Camden Town where he lives. And remember, Dickens is really careful to let us know exactly where Scrooge's office is and where Bob lives. He wants his London readers to make that connection to understand that Bob is not treated in a way which is worse than all other employees in Victorian England are treated. Because his most passionate message is to employers. Social change can't just change through Christmas, through charity. It must change through the way that people are financed through their wage packets. And that is also why the novel ends with Scrooge deciding to pay Bob more. That is much more important than the extra contribution he makes to charity. He doesn't even tell us how much Scrooge contributes to charity because it's not as impactful, it's not as important to society as what he's proposing his readers should do. And something that you might not know Nearly all of Dickens' original readers with that first edition of the book, which they had to pay an absolute fortune for, would have been very middle-class employers. Why? Because everybody employed serving staff. You had a cook, you had a maid of all work at the very least, and probably a number of other staff serving you in your house. Every reader was an employer, Every reader is being asked to pay more by this novella. Another typical interpretation is that Scrooge is motivated by a combination of all the ghosts examining his past and his present and then his future. And it's this cumulative effect that makes him transform. However, we've already seen that he began to transform in stave two. In stave three, he asked the ghost of Christmas present about the prospects for Tiny Tim to see if Tiny Tim will survive in the future. This introduces the theme of fatherhood that underpins the whole novel. We see the issues that Scrooge has had with his relationship with his own father, who was entirely absent. And then Scrooge develops this role of father through Tiny Tim and that is drummed home to us very, very specifically at the end of the novel when Scrooge becomes a second father to Tiny Tim. And those are almost the last words of the novel because this idea is so important. One reason this is so important, of course, is that we are dealing with a patriarchal society and Dickens wants the males, the people who hold the financial purse strings in society, to loosen those purse strings contribute more to charity but also pay more. He wants these men to take on a paternalistic role to act like fathers to the poor rather than being dismissive of them and resorting to this Malthusian interpretation that the poor deserve their poverty because they don't work hard enough, they belong in the workhouse or the prison. Another fascinating bit of context that we can use here 
is that Dickens needed to write this novel to earn money. He was in financial straits, having spent a fortune on a tour of America, and he wasn't able to recoup those expenses. He needed a hit. Christmas was coming, so obviously he wrote a Christmas story. But before he discovered how much money he needed, he was desperate to write about the education of the poor. He'd visited ragged schools and he wanted to write a political pamphlet to persuade people to fund schools that would educate the poor. Why? Because education is the way out of poverty, even more so then than it is today. And this is why we have this fascinating and weird edition of two ghosts you might not have considered. They are the ghosts hidden inside the robe of Christmas present. These are ignorance and want. Ignorance is the one who is going to be most dangerous, according to the ghost. Well, what he means is revolution. Only a few short years after the publication of the novel, we had revolutions spreading across Europe in 1848. And Dickens is saying, look, politically, the poor will only find a way to improve themselves through violence if you deny them education. But if you give them education, the poor will be able to get better jobs and cease being poor. In order to improve society, you must educate them. Now, here's a cool structural point for you. This happens at the very end of stave three. So it's, if you think of the structure of the novel, right at the centre. It's the pivot on which the plot pivots. Well, damn. It's the fulcrum on which the plot pivots. And in this way, Dickens dramatises how important it is. It's a tiny little scene that he can't really go into because that wouldn't fit the rest of the novel. But giving it such prominence asks us to consider why has he done this? Why is this so important? Dickens also wants his readers to understand that the living wage is not a living wage. Everybody who's working their socks off in society amongst the poor are suffering because the middle classes are not paying them enough. And he dramatises this when the ghost of Christmas yet to come takes Scrooge to see what happens after his death. We have the charwoman, the laundress, the undertaker's man, and they have all been forced to steal from Scrooge. Now you might say, hang on a minute, they weren't forced, they had a choice, didn't they? They were just criminals. Dickens puts them in for some comedy value and to shock Scrooge into realising how awful he was that these people now have utter contempt for his dead body. Well, yes, that too, but consider this. They go and visit what we would call a fence, a dealer in stolen goods. He is a very old man, and the description of his poverty is hilarious. His parlour is just behind a scrap of curtain. There's absolutely no decoration. He has to draw on the wall with chalk to work out the prices of what he's going to pay. He's an old man who's not got enough money and he still needs to benefit from crime. Well, what's Dickens' message? It is these people are not being paid enough to survive, and even criminals aren't getting enough to survive. And all that would be flicked on its head, including crime, if employers paid a proper wage. It's also traditional to see Scrooge as a kind of two-dimensional character. He's an exaggerated comic figure, and we can't actually believe that he's a realistic one. However, Dickens is very careful to introduce this idea of attachment. The idea that our past so dramatically influences our personality that it affects the future decisions we make without us even being aware. And as evidence of this, I'm obviously going to put forward his relationship with his father that we dealt with earlier, but let's go a little deeper. What about his relationship with Belle? Well, when the ghost takes him to see Belle enjoying her Christmas now, what Scrooge focuses on isn't his lost love, it is the daughter that he can't have. He imagines Belle's daughter being his own and he reflects that he will never get that experience of fatherhood. 
So we can see the way he has pushed Bell away in his past mimics the way his own father pushed him away. Now this of course is not what Scrooge wanted, it was his unconscious mind repeating that pattern of his youth. But let's go even deeper. This daughter is Bell's oldest child and she also has a number of younger children. We can infer when we play around with the ages that she is no more than about 45 at most. Whereas Scrooge himself is a very old figure. In other words, when he fell in love with Belle, he picked a bride who was far too young for him. Then he stayed engaged to her for many years. He created the circumstances in which his fiancée would see the benefit in leaving him because he simply too old. He chose someone who would be much more likely to abandon him, just as his father abandoned him, just as his mother presumably abandoned him in death because she's never present in the novel, and just as his sister definitely abandoned him in death. To show how important this is, Dickens corrects it at the end because Fred no longer symbolises that abandonment. Scrooge seeks Fred out, he goes to Fred's party and has a wild and vivacious time. Fred has cured him of this feeling of abandonment and therefore that psychologically allows him to transform, allows him to take joy in his fellow man because he's no longer afraid of losing everything precious. Instead, he embraces life to the full. Now this isn't just a message for Scrooge because death was everywhere in Victorian society. About 40% of children died before the age of five. So, so many of Dickens' readers would be living with grief and loss, often repeatedly. Through the figure of Scrooge, Dickens is saying he understands how that would affect the personality of parent. And he's offering hope. Embrace life to the full, and even if you are alone, you can still find meaning. The other way to get grade nine, of course, is to study all the themes of the novel. That's the video that I've got coming up next.